Hey, hello. Good evening, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I imagine many of us are now very used to this kind of setup. This is our second um, virtual lecture in the series of, uh, of guest lectures that we've had over the year. Um, it's a chance for us to bring together a community of people within academia and also outside beyond in heritage fields more generally in terms of policy and practice management, um, consultancy and so, so on, and a chance for us to share ideas um, from a, as wide a field as, as possible. I'm going to introduce our speaker in a second, but before I do, just a few notes on how we'd like to manage this, this talk. Um, first of all, I'm sure we're all well aware now, but if you're not speaking, please do mute your audio. Um, that would be much appreciated. There's going to be plenty of time for Q&As at the end of the talk. Um, we're going to collect Q&As using the Q&A button, um, which on my Zoom is at the bottom menu on the right hand side. So if you have a question you'd like us to consider later, please do use that. Or if you have any comments, um, if you have any comments you want to share, do use the chat. Um, bear in mind there are uh, upwards of 60 people with us now, so please do bear in mind the, um, the size of the audience. Sarah Simmons, uh, we're delighted to have her here. She is the Partnership Management for Stone, Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Sites, the uh, co-author of the first joint Stonehenge and Avery uh, World Heritage Site Management Plan, has a background in um, participatory planning, partnership, planning policy, um, and managing the various different voices and interests that have an interest in um, important places like this. I'm particularly interested to hear about the, um, uh, the nature of the outstanding um, universal value um, quality of the, of the site and looking forward very much to hearing how she manages to uh, how, how the, um, her and colleagues manage to articulate that in the face of the many different competing interests and partnerships. So without further ado I'd like to hand over to Sarah. Welcome, thank you. Thank you and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think I first um, came to the um, Institute when I was um, giving a lecture to your students and um, interestingly it was just around the corner when I studied my Masters in Cultural Heritage at the Institute of Archaeology. So you were always there and now it's a great pleasure to be able to um, give this online lecture. It's my first experience of giving an online lecture. So um, please do forgive me anyone who's watching um, if I do anything slightly strange. <laughs> um, hopefully I won't. So um, uh, um, as Rich has just said, I'm the um, World Heritage Site Partnership Manager and I am currently based with Wiltshire Council and I'm funded by Wiltshire Council and um, Historic England, who funds one of the posts in our coordination unit. And that's the officer post who works with me. Um, we sit within the council, but we work um, in an independent fashion, if you will, um, with all of our stakeholders, because our main focus is the World Heritage Site, its protection and management. So we work um, with all, all of the range of stakeholders to put forward that message and to listen to them and to understand how they can best work with us. So without further ado, I'm going to leap in and talk about Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Site. So um, I think we probably all know where, where it is. I don't know, people could be joining us from all over the world. So um, it is, sits in um, southwest England, just there, just about a couple of hours from London. It's a serial site, um, so we have two halves, Stonehenge in the south of Wiltshire and Avery in the north of the county, about 40 kilometres apart, and um, each area covering around 25 square kilometres. So normally most people want to talk about the monument, Stonehenge the monument, and of course it is a, a stunning monument, possibly the most famous prehistoric monument globally, but um, we're going to go a lot further beyond that today because the World Heritage Site is more than just this monument and it's also more than the other amazing Henge monument in the Avebury part of the site. Both of the monuments sit at the heart of incredibly densely um, rich archaeological landscapes. Um, we're going to go out and have a little look around those landscapes and then talk about why we're a World Heritage Site and how we look after and protect our outstanding universal value, that thing that qualifies us to be a World Heritage Site in what is after all an evolving landscape. We're all dealing with managing in heritage, managing change. It's 
has its own special challenges in the World Heritage Site. So we're going to go through three stages in the talk. As I said, looking at the outstanding universal value, then thinking about how we protect and manage it and certain tensions and challenges, which having a broad partnership brings, but also how we can work together as partners to find responses to those those challenges. And finally, I'm going to quickly talk about um, emerging and future challenges. Well, <laughs> some of them very much with us and how we um, organise responding to those or hope we will be able to respond to them in the future. So first of all, it's outstanding universal value. So what is a World Heritage Site? I'm sure many of, of you will be very well aware, but of course, um, World Heritage Site, the concept of that came out of the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Culture and Natural Heritage, that UNESCO Convention created in 1972. It's one of the most successful of the UNESCO Conventions, all based on really that feeling of um, the need in that time of great change during the 50s, 60s, 70s, post Second World War, the need to protect uh, the, 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 cult, the cultural and natural uh, highlights of the whole planet during a time of great development, much of it funded by World Bank um, and IMF um, funding to, to, to create development, but how are we going to look after our cultural and natural heritage? Currently there are 167 state parties who have signed up to this convention, very, very popular, and um, over a thousand sites, the majority um, are cultural sites. Um, but we also have natural and cultural natural sites, some of them transboundary and uh, unfortunately 53 of them on the uh, in danger list, but looking to improve um, only 2D listed, which um, is an unfortunate thing which we always want to avoid. And that is where you lose your outstanding universal value, often through development within the site. But there could be a number of reasons, but we work hard with UNESCO and um, nationally and locally to ever prevent such a thing happening. So when we sign up to that convention, we do actually have obligations and probably the most talked about obligation is the fourth article. And this is we ourselves must identify what we think is of global significance. We present that to UNESCO and the committee and they decide whether it qualifies. Then we are obliged to protect, conserve, present it and transmit it to future generations. So looking after what we've identified as of outstanding universal value. Article five is giving that cultural and natural heritage of function in the life of the community, which may be economic, it, it may be well-being, it could be anything, but it's not to take away that heritage to a global level, but to maintain that local engagement and value. And Article 27 is part of that really, is reflected in the, the, the requirement to have education and information to help people um, strengthen their understanding and appreciation. So, that magic word, some of you will be very familiar with this if you work in world heritage, others perhaps less. So outstanding universal value. Um, what is that? Well, let's shorten it to OUV, otherwise I will run over time. So um, it's a cultural or natural um, significance that is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. And that's coming out of the guideline for implementation of the World Heritage Convention. So really we're identifying things that are of such significance that they are significance to everybody across the world. There are lots of people who may say that's a very problematic concept, but um, UNESCO has worked very hard to broaden that out that concept of value and um, significance to include um, many different countries going way beyond the monumental and European Eurocentric base now um, into cultural landscapes across the world and um, many types of monument and, and other um, place of cultural and natural significance. So you have to qualify. There are 10 criteria to qualify for OUV. You have to prove that you have those criteria and Stonehenge and Avery um, joined the World Heritage Site list in 1986. The UK ratified the convention in 84 and in 86 they put forward seven sites including Stonehenge and Avery and we were put forward under three of the criteria, um, the first being human creative genius, the second having exerted a great influence over a span of time and the third bearing a unique or at least exceptional testimony um, to a disappeared civilization. So we were 
put forward in 1986, nominated by the government, and we were accepted onto the site then. So we do have quite a long history as a World Heritage Site. And during that period, we've seen a huge evolution in the understanding of what a World Heritage Site is and how to look after it. So now since 2007, all World Heritage Sites must have a statement saying exactly what their outstanding universal value is. When we got on the list, we didn't have this um, short focus statement. We had nomination documents, um, much shorter uh, than they are nowadays, which is a huge uh, kilograms of documents produced um, and going into great detail in 1986, a shorter process and without this statement. We now have these statements. We produced ours retrospectively based on those nomination documents. So the key things to think of in relation to our site are its complexes of outstanding prehistoric monuments. And these monuments together with related monuments and sites in that area create a landscape without parallel. So you're looking at the interrelated complex of sites within the landscape, creating a landscape of huge value. The dates that fall into our outstanding universal value are 3,700 to 1,600 BC from the Neolithic through into the Bronze Age. So we also go one step further now in trying to identify exactly what is important about the site. And we have been producing attributes of OUV. This was on the recommendations of um, UNESCO. And we spent some time many years ago really pinning down what it was that we could say are the attributes for Stonehenge and Avery. And this is an incredibly useful piece of work because it enables us to stop talking about outstanding universal value and um, concepts, philosophical concepts, and try and start bringing it down into a physical spatial understanding of what it is we're protecting, because otherwise it's very difficult to protect it. Um, having said that, the first attribute is Stonehenge as a globally famous and iconic monument. That, that, that will always stand there. And that is really a, almost an intangible value. There's the monument itself, but its value is, is, is goes on beyond that into the intangible nature of a sign. Maybe sometimes it's seen as very much related to the, this country, or it can also be seen as very much related to the first development, perhaps, of... Um, humankind in the area of architecture and 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 such things so there is attribute one but then we go into the more physical elements and attribute two is actually those physical remains that's very easy to understand i think the physical remains of the neolithic and bronze age funerary and ceremonial monuments the third is how those monuments sit in relationship to the landscape so if we go back to the time of when the convention was put forth and you had the trouble of Abu Simbel being picked up and moved to protect it from the Aswan Dam development, uh, if we started moving monuments around in our landscape to protect them from development, we would lose this all important thing. So looking at them, why were they placed there in relation to, to the landscape? The fourth is their relationship to skies and astronomy, which we'll look at briefly. This is very much, um, uh, of obvious in the Stonehenge landscape and of course in the monument of Stonehenge itself, a little bit less um, sure in the Avery landscape, but uh, yeah, definite design in relation to the skies and astronomy. So the fifth attribute is the way the monuments relate to each other. They may have large um, periods of time apart, um, maybe a thousand years, as you saw, we, we are spanning a, a large time period in our outstanding universal value but the way they relate to each other where they're positioned and placed how they might have been seen we're beginning to understand more and more about the landscape and how it would have looked and the tree cover through um, environmental archaeology and we're beginning to understand what would or wouldn't have been seen um, in in that landscape when you were building even large numbers of years apart the sixth um attribute is really wrapping up all of those things and understanding that what we then have are is a landscape or in fact, in our case, two landscapes, Avebury and Stonehenge, are without parallel due to all of these um, issues coming together, the astronomical alignment, the relationship to the landscape, the relationship to each other, and that amazing density of monuments and their uh, wonderful, in most cases, survival. The last one, we go back into the realm of the intangible a little more and start talking about the influence. So that influence is a long-standing influence and still exists today. And it's something we need to be able to protect and build on um, and enable um, people still to enjoy 
that um, impact of the monuments um, in the way that they would choose and also scientists, historians, archaeologists, etc. So these are the things that are important about the site when we drill right down. This is what really qualifies us to be a site transcending national boundaries of such importance, of, of, of international importance. So we think quickly about the physical remains of the Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments. I'll just take you for a very quick tour, seeing as we can't go out, although I think we are. I can't quite, I'm not sure if Boris has said we can go there or not, but maybe just to have a look in the landscape and come home. Um, we have the um, amazing um, number of monuments. We have um, seven hundred known archaeological features within the Stonehenge part of the World Heritage Site and we have about 450 in the acre part that's including fine sites etc 600 burial mounds and here this is um, a, a group of burial mounds Normanton Down which um, are in the Stonehenge part of the landscape and those are Bronze Age um, burial mounds we've got um, yeah around 600 across the whole site around 350 in the Stonehenge part and in Avery, um, 250. Uh, we've got long barrows as well. So part of that 600, we've got 10 long barrows. Um, Neolithic long barrows, these are Bronze Age um, barrows, but 10, 10 Neolithic long barrows in Stonehenge and six in Avery. Quite, quite remarkable, I have a photo of those coming. But this is the Stonehenge landscape, a map from the management plan. And here you see Stonehenge right at the middle. So you can really understand the immensity of the landscape and the pink areas are scheduled monuments. So you can see all of the archaeology throughout the landscape and we must never forget there's a lot of archaeology in that landscape which isn't scheduled that also contributes to the outstanding universal value coming from that um, period. Um, of course we have Stonehenge but then we have avenues, we have um, the uh, rather wonderful avenue at Stonehenge um, leading out into the landscape, we have avenues um, at Avebury as well, um, two avenues coming out from the central henge, S same period around 2500 BC. We have a um, rather amazing Neolithic monument here, the Cursus, um, there's a greater cursus, sorry, and a lesser cursus. And uh, we're still really unsure about what this large earthwork um, actually is, but um, it's called cursus because it was considered in antiquity perhaps to have been a race course, a Roman race course, so hence cursus. But we still don't know, it could have been some kind of boundary um, division, but it is a massive um, piece of engineering, if you will, shaping the landscape from the Neolithic. Um, another large henge here at Stonehenge, sorry, um, yes, a henge, um, the Durrington Walls, which um, is, is huge in circumference. As you can see, it's now crossed by modern roads, but um, we, we have other large henge monuments in, in the Stonehenge landscape. Um, often you, 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 you can hear Mike Parker Pearson's theories around this being the landscape of the living, because there's lots of um, remains of feasting, etc., and then Stonehenge, the landscape of stone, the landscape of memorialization and funerary landscape. These are um, some of the amazing number of theories around um, Stonehenge and its uh, landscape. Avebury, similar sized Stonehenge um, with a large um, Avebury Henge at the centre, the avenue. You have an area here of Bronze Age field systems, up here Neolithic, um, Windmill Hill. Then you have some beautiful um, long barrows, Neolithic long barrows here and here and Silbury Hill. So we'll just take a quick look. So we have the avenues leading out into the landscape. We have um, replaced the stones which were laying down. Those were replaced by Kilo in the 30s. So and there are little markers where the stones have lost but large sarsa stones from the local area. That's Windmill Hill, a causeway enclosure, Neolithic causeway enclosure, with wonderful views out of the World Heritage Site up to the north, but an amazing gathering place um, for people with those incredible views of the wider landscape. And here, um, the remarkable um, West Kennet Long Barrow, a Neolithic Long Barrow, with the uh, burial chambers at this end. A uh, huge earthwork, uh, very impressive on the skyline in the landscape. And then we have Silver Hill. So, um, there are many more monuments, but these are some of the standout ones. And this is in the Avery part of the World Heritage Site. And if you haven't been there, I would definitely recommend exploring that landscape. Silbury Hill, largest um, uh, artificial mound made of, of tons of chalk taken from the, from the local area. Still don't really know what it 
what it was there for. We've um, stabilized it um, after a number of excavations um, in the 19th century and more recently in the 1960s, it was stabilized with a big project by English Heritage, Historic England now in 2007. And uh, nothing was found but lots of exciting um, environmental evidence uh, with lots of um, pieces of turf and sarsens that must have been placed, leading um, Jim Leary, um, one of the archaeologists, to talk about it being a microcosm of the wider landscape, another um, theory about the site. Now we're going to keep looking at Silbury and go back to those attributes. So those are all the physical things which people may think about, but don't forget we're also talking about relationship to landscape features. That was the um, third attribute. So relationship to landscape features. And here you see a very interesting aspect here because um, Silbury Hill sits in an area where there is flooding for parts of the year. And it's an area also where people have done work looking at the warmth of the springs that come up around. And this could very well have been an area where it was greener earlier in the year, making people put this unusual um, monument. Not, 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 it's not on a ridge line, it's, it's down deeper in the valley. And it's, um, you know, it's a question of why it was there, but there are those landscape clues around the warmer springs, the fact that it's at the head of the river Kennet, all sorts of relationships to the topography, which make it much more interesting and much more uh, fascinating to explore and think about what, what people were thinking and how they were using that landscape. Um, relationship to other monuments when we move on through those attributes. If we look here, you can see the burial chambers here of the West Kennet Long Barrow, which we saw earlier in the Avery part of the site. And over here you've got Silbury Hill. Now these were built around a thousand years apart, so the uh, 3,500 circa BC, the Neolithic and over here Silbury Hill built around 2,500, I'm just giving rough figures. Um, so that was a similar period to the Henge, but um, there was a lot of activity going on that landscape there and this Long Barrow must have been visible. We think now, particularly as we're getting more information from people like Mike Allen and Josh Pollard around the landscape there, that it was you know, probably visible. And um, it was actually closed up with a huge sarsen, that burial chamber, around the time that the Henge and Silbury Hill were being built. So the burial chamber was sealed with a large sarsen a thousand years after it was built. So interesting to think about and explore those relationships. Um, I like this, this um, demonstration of the wider landscape and the links in it. Now this is from Stukeley, an antiquarian in the 18th century who's proved very accurate when you go and ground truth him. A lot of archaeologists use, use his work. And this shows us the Avebury Henge, 1.3 kilometres round, and the two stone circles that would sit within it um, previously. And it shows you the avenues. That's that West Kennet Avenue we saw coming off and out. And it goes off to this um, ridge here which we now have the Ridgeway National Trail and it, there's also um, up here there is the sanctuary which was a stone and wooden circular monument. We also have the Beckhampton Avenue coming out here but you can see the relationship to other monuments in the landscape particularly with something as straightforward as that avenue leading out. We still have some stones here and we know its route um, but a lot of them are lost through you know, farming and other use of the landscape. Of course, we have the skies and astronomy. So um, Stonehenge, very obvious. Um, and uh, coming up to that time of year, we have the midsummer solstice, that sunrise when it rises very clearly between the trilith and there. Um, you also have, of course, the other side of the year when it sinks in, in the midwinter sunset there coming down um, with that very careful alignment through the monument. Um, often thought, to be perhaps the more um, significant um, as it sinks into the monument over the winter to be held and, and until the spring and the renewal, uh, another, I must say, a, a theory um, due, due to, the, to the lack of, of evidence. But actually there is evidence of design, clear evidence of design that this was related to the skies and astronomy. Then of course we have that last intangible um, attribute. So, Stonehenge particularly and um, other parts of the World Heritage Site and other monuments but Stonehenge particularly has always held a really um, important place in the imagination of the nation and of course here we have this very famous Turner painting 
um, with a deceased shepherd, possibly struck by lightning, very powerful romantic image. Um, we have later Paul Nash, landscape of the megaliths, possibly inspired more by um, the Avery area that he was visiting, a, a more a modernist interpretation. Uh, here I'd like to show this, this goes wrong sometimes with young students watching who uh, don't quite recognise them, but I think we all should, the Rolling Stones at Avebury, coming up the avenue. Um, a place that people go to be seen. Um, you have the Della inflatable Stonehenge, you, you, have, you have the Transformers film. It's still very, very um, so well known that, that people use it as, as truly as an, as an iconic um, backdrop. Um, and then, of course, we have the summer solstice here, um, a managed access event. It has that great um, spiritual or even festival um, attraction for a large number of people, um, pagans, of course, and beyond the pagans um, more widely, too. So those are the things we've got to look after. These are the things that are so important, um, are so internationally precious. And we have to look after and manage that. So how do we manage that? And what are the, some of the tensions and um, challenges that we come across? And what have we done? Well, one of um, the biggest challenges is we're not managing um, a single stately home in one ownership. Um, of course, that has huge numbers of challenges too, but we have different challenges. We have um, two large landscape areas um, under um, multiple ownership. Uh, you see uh, the lighter green areas are owned by the National Trust and in the centre there um, is English Heritage who looks after the um, stone, of Stonehenge itself. The other areas in the other colours are all in private land ownership um, and you know that as we saw the um, monuments run throughout the landscape and there are links back and forth across the landscape. So this is what we're looking after with heritage agencies, but also with lots of private owners as well, and usually farmers in this area. Um, and Avery too, um, you see the same sort of situation. We have um, the green area, a third of the site in National Trust ownership, but um, the other colours um, are, are private landowners and we need to work together with them to map the site. Um, as I was saying and hinting then, we have a lot of different partners and that's just a small selection of some of the partners we work with, the museums, etc., who, who are outside the World Heritage Site, but also all of the natural designations, the, the AOMB at Avery, and um, Hyres Agency Visit Wiltshire. That, that's just a, a, f a few of the partners we work with. So, challenges to the physical remains of monuments the one of the biggest challenges we have as you can imagine in an archaeological landscape that is also a rural farming landscape is plowing the biggest cause of damage to monuments is cultivation so that's something we have to address very very carefully if something is scheduled and not in the plow obviously you won't stop plowing it but, uh, but uh, there's a lot of monuments aren't scheduled and a lot of monuments that have been under the plow for a very long time so this is one of our major challenges and the way we the way we face that is through um, working very closely with landowners and farmers to encourage them to enter into agreements to stop ploughing over the most sensitive areas. And this has huge benefits for the natural world because we like to go back to um, the right um, grass mixes, um, the right benefits for wildflowers, flora, fauna. We work with Natural England on this, and um, we we are using money coming in from Europe, a little more of that later perhaps. Um, so this is one of the earliest projects which was um, a really fruitful project with um, DEFRA at the time and English Heritage National Trust and the World Heritage Site and local landowners looking at an enhanced payment to take that most sensitive archaeology out of the plough. Um, this was back I think in 2000, but um, now we have more um, evolved, or, or, or we have had more evolved um, environmental stewardship schemes and, and we can't pay double. We used to pay double in the World Heritage Site. Now we have to look at a points system and look at um, qualifying for higher level stewardship. And then you can be paid um, an income to protect the, um, not just the natural, um, not, not, not just the natural environment, but the historic environment, which they're, they're inextricably intertwined in the World Heritage Site and most places in the UK. Um, we have around 40% uh, of um, the World Heritage Site now 
under stewardship. Some of that is grassland restoration, which is really great. Um, that takes its own management, but it takes things right out of the plough. Um, we also have other um, other approaches, which are minimum till and uh, other minimum tillage to, to prevent deep damage. So we, we have a lot of different levels of, of scheme that we work with Natural England to, um, well, and of course the farmers who only enter these things if it make sense for them because they also need their livelihood to be there. As I was saying, we often have great benefits for the natural environment. And you can see a, a wonderful walk out around Stonehenge here, working with the RSPB and the National Trust um, around areas that are reverted grassland. The National Trust have done a great deal of work out in the Stonehenge landscape. Trees are another challenge, um, which people love and want to see trees um, marking barrows in what we call hedgehogs on the skyline. They're the barrows with beautiful beech trees on, but they can also be quite problematic because they can fall and um, leave great tree throws in a Bronze Age barrow. So we have to be very careful and we have um, approaches to this, to the care and management of the trees and to looking at potential um, other sites. We produced a woodland strategy for the whole landscape. We also have another um, challenge in the World Heritage Site, which is burrowing animals. They, they can create problems in the landscape and they can be quite challenging to manage. Um, also, of course, um, there are lots of different opinions about how they should be managed. But um, one of the um, key animals that can <clears throat> be problematic for archaeology is the badger. But of course, badgers um, must be protected and they um, and we can look at ways to manage them. We've just produced a strategy to look at how we can maybe tempt them into other parts of the landscape through different planting and different crops, crops that they'll be interested in, such as maize, et cetera, and how, what we can do about excluding them from monuments. The trouble in such a landscape is if you do that, they'll go into the next monument. So it's very complicated. So how can we live with them, um, but keep safe those, those monuments? Relationship to skies and astronomy is another thing we have to, um, we sometimes run into challenges with. And one of the biggest challenges for th keeping these things clear and legible is development. So in a farming landscape, you may get big grain stores and other barns. And we have to be very, very careful and work with farmers to make sure these are not on sensitive um, lines and that uh, we go for the right design and, and um, the right palette, et cetera, to minimize intrusion in, in areas. Of course, we want to manage the site sustainably. We are, after all, a UNESCO site. We are interested in the principles of sustainability. Um, we do have to be mindful of how wind farms, which seem to be less now, but often um, PV, solar farms, how they will impact on the OUV. Where should they go? Um, it's about where they should go, maybe in the setting of the site that is not going to intrude or impact on our ability to understand the links between the monuments and their prominence in the landscape. So that's something we work with partners to um, try to achieve. You've got guidance here from Historic England and the World Heritage Unit works too with partners if um, proposals come forward. We also have, of course, the need um, for always economic development. And I think this may come back really strongly after COVID, that need, you know, that real push where we have to have recovery. And um, there was talk, uh, it seems to have um, not, not be on the table right at the moment, but may come back, of taking one of the um, Boscombe Down Air Base very near to Stonehenge in the setting of the landscape, the World Heritage Landscape, and Boeing coming in there. Now, this is not, this is not a real photograph. We don't like overflying, really, if we can avoid it. But this is... Um, Put together to, to just show you know Boeing is would be proud to be near Stonehenge but as far as the landscape and its um tranquility we, we we have to work very carefully to ensure that um any development is 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 suitable and takes and bears in mind that we need to protect the OUV of course we have the road I'll come back a little bit to that later so we have the guidance from ICOMOS um that's internationally um relevant guidance produced in 2011 that allows us to assess impacts because sometimes it's not that clear what the impacts will be on such a complicated range of attributes. So this allows us to judge um, impacts on the attributes um, in a systematic way, very similar to an EIA, but really focusing because an EIA doesn't focus full extent on OUV, but um, tends to separate a little between archaeology and landscape. This brings us to look at cultural world heritage sites. Um, 
I think the key uh, aspect of this is the challenge that we come across over and over again, OUV is fixed. It, it, it was defined at the time of description and it's non-negotiable. Okay, so it's fixed, but we all live in evolving landscapes and have to manage change. How do we do it? So World Heritage Society is a single asset, so do we have to keep them in aspect? Well, uh, not everything relates to OUV. So it's understanding what you can do and where and how, because not everything in that landscape is of OUV. It's back to those seven attributes. So managing sustainable change, um, in certain cases, it may be necessary to look at public benefit and look at a balance between the protection and the public benefit. And this is the most, I would say, the centre of the presentation and the most fraught aspect, because um, you can have quite a lot of different opinions about what that correct balance is. And that is a whole other lecture. But um, this is the, the, the fine line, the, the right balance. Um, we have within our own PPG in, uh, nationally and the understanding that the OUV is the same as significance really. So we use the statements of, of OUV as key references. So we have good um, visibility within the PPG, um, the PPG and also within the MPPF at the moment. So that's helpful. Locally, we are required to have policies and Wiltshire Core Strategy has a good strong policy on the Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Site. Even daring to talk about the precedence, where is it? the precedence of the protection of the World Heritage Site and its setting. That's another key aspect we need to think about. The setting is part of how you experience it, but as you can imagine, the setting of a World Heritage Site is large. So we're talking about precedence, but in the UK, in the English planning system, of course, you have to always think about balance as well. So but we have a nice strong policy to bring forward to developers and to ask them to provide the correct amount of evidence and the right evidence so that we can consider what the right balance is. As I just mentioned, we have to think about setting. We think about setting with heritage assets and with a landscape, we have to think about it too. That's a challenge. We're in the process of producing a setting study to help uh, developers understand and planners understand what kind of um, impacts will, um, what kind of change in the setting could have a deleterious impact. We also look for positive changes we can find as well in the setting. Uh, very important in Stonehenge at the moment, we have army rebasing, we have possible Boeing, we have development, lots of housing developments around there. So we, we, we do have to be mindful of that. Um, of course, the other issue is roads now. Um, roads always intrude and they split landscapes, they cut links. And this is one of the um, most clear examples, the um, A344 that ran up the side of Stonehenge and that was shut back in 2013 as part of the general improvements of the um, area around the uh, Stonehenge monument. Lots of hard work from English Heritage, Historic England, National Trust, um, and of course, um, local communities were very much involved. And of course, Wiltshire Council was very, very much involved in moving forward with this. A promise we'd made UNESCO in 1986 to reinstate the avenue links, as you can see here, it was split and really we have a great result so there you go we also have to um, acknowledge that it may have sent some traffic around and there are some of our local villages in the area that feel there's more traffic it's, it's very fraught roads because um, they will have impacts on different stakeholders and they, that needs to be carefully managed um, can't get rid of it entirely and we are still now in the process of one of the biggest and perhaps most controversial road projects in the World Heritage Site, the tunnel scheme. Now that is currently sitting, um, waiting for a decision. We were due for a decision on April the 2nd, but due to COVID, um, that's been delayed. So we're looking probably into July. Um, this has had a whole long process and um, the development consent order process of examination um, with large numbers of people involved, with people on many many sides of of the discussion feeling that it's giving us a great advantage by linking the site and there's also some people who feel that the fact that it comes up within the site and impacts within the site um, is unacceptable to them so that remains the discussion that wonderful HIA discussion where is the right balance so the Secretary of State is going to tell us in July their 
result, the planning inspectors report and whether they think it will be given permission. And we also wait for UNESCO to tell us what they feel about it. Um, the UNESCO um, committee has, has not been happy ab ab about the length of the road, wanting it to be longer to go outside of the site. Um, so we, we also wait to hear what they think of the latest plans. Um, yeah, an interesting project with many benefits and some um, possible disbenefits. So I, I, I'll allow you to think about that. And the scheme objectives, of course, were not just cultural heritage. Um, a huge investment and design and thought has gone into this, of course, but they were also thinking about transport, economic growth and environment and community. So those things have all been balanced. In Avebury, we have a transport strategy giving us um, transport um, principles and designs and also schemes to help minimise the road impact there because, of course, roads and most extremely traffic um, have a huge impact there. As far as people and influence and archaeologists and historians, we still have a great, we have a research framework for the site. Everybody's very interested in working there. We, we have to be very careful about what permission is given. The National Trust Historic England, Wiltshire Council, work hard to make sure that we don't just um, have intrusive um, projects unless they really are important for answering crucial questions. We also have lots of, of course, non-intrusive intervention. This was an amazing um, project, European, um, UK project, hidden landscapes and using the most advanced magnetometry, et cetera, to look, um, scan into the ground and huge amounts of data is still being assessed, but they do believe that new monuments are being found. So we're constantly working, those archaeologists are constantly inspired by the landscape and our understanding of the landscape is constantly evolving. Of course, another human impact is tourism so when people used to come out in the period of shell here we have this beautiful um picture of stonehenge people would rush to see it when they first got cars and petra when they would come out and of course what everybody says to me i remember when we could sit on it still very important that remembrance for people of going there and sitting on it but of course it becomes crowded and it becomes impossible and this is the old um, visitor centre shop that we used to have and this was one of the things that was swept away beautifully by the project um, the um, environmental improvement scheme so the road was taken out the a344 and the parking and the facilities have all now been moved up to the new visitor centre in 2013 run by english heritage with their award-winning um, building there with a um, great chance for um on-site interpretation which we didn't have before and there's a great um, wall um, a video showing us about the importance of the landscape and the links and also the chance for people who can no longer go into the stones only on special occasions to really experience a little bit of that wall um, by standing in that um, lovely film you, you, you find at the beginning of the visitor centre also had the chance to go in a neolithic um, house and experience really bring people into you know, meeting our um, obligations of appreciation and understanding um, of the site. Avebury, of course, we have a village in the centre of Avebury. Very, very interesting, but open access. But of course, it's so important that the village and uh, who are actually some of the key custodians of the site are involved with it. So we have um, lots of involvement when we have any excavation. There's lots of invites. We were even partly funded by the parish council and a little Avery local trust for the World Heritage Site. Um, the, one of the living monuments, living landscape projects was came, gained a little bit of funding for finishing off a project. Um, we also did a big project um, a few years ago now with the people of Avery looking at the different values within the site and getting them to write about these themselves and how they viewed the site. This was when um, I first arrived and we were looking at giving back what can sometimes be seen as a a uh, global um, uh, abstract concept, giving it back to understand what made it important to local people. Um, that was a pack that went to all of the houses and, and seems to be treasured to, to this day. We were lucky if you'd done that in Bath, where I'm certainly sitting now, you couldn't afford to give everybody in the whole place pack. In Avebury, we only had 300 households, so we could manage to produce that. We could do it online now. Maybe we'll do it for Stonehenge. This is, um, somebody volunteering um, for, this is an English Heritage volunteer. We have lots of volunteers for National Trust as well. Also, I think the National Trails too. We have lots of volunteer groups working within the World Heritage Site. Here, here they are building a um, one of the um, 
Neolithic houses at Stonehenge, a really good way to get people involved. And of course, we have managed access at Stonehenge um, and also Avebury, which allows um, people still to come for those, those key moments, those key observances in the year. This is a lovely project by um, English Heritage where people sent in memories of their relationship to the site and then they reproduced some of those poses. So here you have um, a, small, um, a small girl with her father leaning against the stone near the circle and here you have her um, again taking that pose but I think this isn't her father, this is actually her husband so she seems to have married someone who looks very much like her father but I think he's probably borrowed his jumper. Um, I particularly like this, it's, it's lovely about people what it means to people personally but it also shows how nowadays you don't lean on stones I, I, I thought that was quite interesting changing changing uh, approaches to conservation so emerging um dealing with future challenges i'll wind up very quickly well yeah future challenges we we think we can see them coming we prepare for them we have uh, our climate change assessment our risk assessment but you know who would have thought we'd be in the situation we are in now but I have to say that the management plan is a perfect tool for bringing us all together to um, produce ways of dealing with current situations and looking at how we would like the site to be. And working together with all of those partners is an absolutely key document, the process of doing this, the process of working with people who can affect the site to, to, to ensure that we all understand and value what is the outstanding universal value alongside our own personal, professional or uh, economic values. So um, we have the um, need to create the right balance. So this is the point of the management plan, the balance between the OUV and all of those other recreation, local community, farming, tourism, education. So we work together with all of those partners to create a vision and we also bear in mind very strongly in the statement of OUV because that is what the main driving force of the plan is, that but balanced with the other values. We have developed, um, we look at key issues in the site for protecting it, but also for ensuring that people's livelihood and visitors' experiences um, are, are good. Um, and we look at the issues for that and we come up with aims and policies. And then we have an action plan, a, a long prioritized action plan. The action plan is a long action plan. It's about 178 um, actions, but we work with partners. We, we as a unit don't have to deliver that. We facilitate this process and work with partners in the delivery um, and, and update the plan, etc. But um, having that the, the, those actions there is really, really helpful. Uh, now it took us about 18 months because we brought together both sides. They were both managed um, separately when we had district councils, but we brought them together under Wiltshire Council. Um, we had one um, World Heritage Site unit. They came together. We're very joined up now in our management of the two landscapes. We also had a three month public consultation and people could have responded from around the globe for that. That went through the, the normal council public um, consultation process. This plan is owned by all partners and endorsed formally by all partners. We have a structure for that, delivery of that, committees, a chair of those committees, one at Stonehenge, one at Avebury. We also have a panel in the middle who deals with strategic projects across the site. We also have a very important research group which um, works. We have academics and professionals in that group who um, work with us to make sure that we increase and improve our understanding of the site. Um, all of this needs to be managed and worked on and as a resource has to be provided to keep that wider focus, that wider push for delivery, that wider vision together. And that is the role of the World Heritage Site Unit, the coordination unit, which I work for with my colleague um, as well. Now, the management plan, that, that has to be funded. And we've been in a period of um, reduction in funding. And policy um, 8B was looking at making sure we had sustainable funding. We also had policies in that plan around managing visitors in an exemplary fashion in line with international guidance on sustainable tourism. We also had um, 4C around access and circulation, which means really, really looking after those monuments, but allowing people to get out and about. And finally, 6C, um, making sure we have sustainable transport in place. So um, these two things, I'm talking about them now, these are examples. Um, that management plan helps us to push for things. One of the things we've been pushing for and working for together is looking at that sustainable um, process for the coordination and the delivery of the core functions which we need to do for the protection of the site and its enhancement. So we have money from Heritage um, 
the um I always get it wrong now they've changed it so it's the <laughs> National Lottery Heritage Fund um so we have money from them to, to to put together the best form of governance the best form of fundraising and create an independent trust possibly alongside the union now to make sure we can push forward with those bigger landscape wide projects to look up to the site so we're in the process of that we've also just um, received funding from designated funds related to infrastructure projects and um, those are given um, whether or not projects go ahead so we took the chance to take this and do our landscape access sustainable transport and tourism strategy we've just completed that and that was with arab who delivered that and arab are very keen on this and we're keen on it we're a part of the unesco un family we're very keen that we do fit with any development that should be helpful for the site and the organizations who look after it and the community it must fit with those sustainable development goals so we asked for those to be um, considered in any recommendations from arab so uh, that was great as i said we have our climate change risk assessment so we think we know what's happening we think the warmer um wetter winters are possibly problematic for erosion in a site with many earth, earth and monuments etc we have other issues but we we look for the uh, alerts areas when we need to make changes to our management um, approach when we reach certain um levels of impact on the site so so we have that uh this is an old picture but it's one I can't resist. We didn't quite expect Brexit to come along, but well, perhaps we should have done, but it, it has come along. And this is an issue which the management plan and the partners need to think about lobbying to ensure that whatever is put in place around funding for environmental stewardship, if you remember, I said how important that was for the protection of the site. We have to make sure that whatever um, world we emerge into um, when we come out of the virus, <laughs> into Brexit, that um, we do have funding there to help landowners, to help us all protect that site. And of course, coronavirus, this is where I'm going to finish really. So um, yesterday it was announced that managed access at Stonehenge will not be taking place this year. Quite understandably, um, um, English Heritage has thought long and hard about this and really tried to, 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 to put the best plan in place because they have been enabling this, this to happen over the years. But this year, with all of the advice and guidance, um, it means that um, it would be very hard to keep people at a safe distance for, for, for visitors and for staff to that. So um, we're, we're waiting for an announcement in Avery, but 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 this was this, this is one of the unfortunate aspects of it also coronavirus has furloughed so many of the staff who are responsible for the site and looking after the site and also staff who are um are responsible for responding to ongoing infrastructure projects and other elements so it's, it's putting a, a strain on the world heritage site as it is on everybody um it's also putting a strain on organizations and trusts um that are reliant on visitor income to push back into the trust such as National Trust English Heritage to help us look after the heritage. So, heritage. so these are all challenges for us and we'll have to address these um, as we move forward and come out the other side. Um, we do hope and we've been working with World Heritage UK um, to discuss how all of the World Heritage sites, the 32 across the UK are being affected and we're hoping that we'll be recognised as a, you know, a huge asset that could help with recovery. So maybe we will be um, you know, able to gain some support for the ongoing protection management and uh, sustainable tourism provided by our sites to, to, to keep those trusts, the big trusts and the smaller trusts who look after many other sites, um, many other sites um, uh, are, are have a fragmentary, if not more so, um, profile of ownership and engagement that, as we do. So we are hoping very much that we will um, be able to emerge strong from that. Um, interestingly, um, there, have, there has been support, but um, it's, it's quite difficult to apply for some of those grants um, due, to, due to staff being, um, in many cases, further. To, but we hope as we move forward, we'll find ways to gather through World Heritage UK with Historic England. Finally, I should say that we were due to have the 44th session of the World Heritage Committee. That's held every year when we get new sites put on the list and we deal with any issues at the site. And we were hoping that we would get some feedback on the A303 infrastructure um, project. So um, that now has been delayed. That was going to be happening in Fuzhou, I think I said that right, in China. Um, but that, that is now delayed. It would have normally happened in July. But that, that is another 
one of, of the um, impacts that, that we're all dealing with um, across the world. So um, I will end there, hoping for um, positive recovery for these incredible sites and all the people that look after them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm sure everyone is joining me in a kind of a virtual round of applause for that um, huge tour of the various different interests and uh, factors that have a, a, a kind of a history and connection to the site. I was particularly taken with the, you know, what a great illustration it is of, um, rather than thinking about trying to make an argument for any intrinsic value in, in the material aspect of the site, that all the value is produced through the relations across kind of time and space with other bits of human life, um, contemporary and and his, historic um loads to think about i love some of the visual stuff as well that map of the um the visual sense the visual sense sensitivity i'm fascinated to see how they might have made that however it's not just about me we have a couple of questions at least in the, um, five minutes to address them so um page scene thank you very much page asks in a world where so many people are facing extreme economic and health crises in addition to all of the ongoing conflicts around the world how do we convince governments and the public of the importance of caring for heritage sites? Um, that's, that's a really interesting question and um, I think somehow um, heritage sites have gained um, uh, prominence during this huge crisis um, and during the lockdown. There's been a lot of interest both online and um, in the, the, the wider media in our heritage sites and we see from um, the fact that people are so keen still to go to the sites even though this year it's it's not being advised due to due to the coronavirus it is actually a time a time of stress a time of challenge and um a time of loss and economic challenge to to, to actually be able to go to a heritage site and a site like stonehenge and Avery and to just stand in the landscape which has survived all those years and all of those catastrophes and crises uh, from the Neolithic through to the present day. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's almost a, a way to, to persuade people of their importance for that um, level of well-being and grounding and um, really the, um, the, the perspective that, that they offer. Mm, mm. Yes. Mm. I mean, I wonder you mentioned as well the kind of the um, the likely i I, th I think you're right the, the economic pressures that will face not just stonehenge but lots of heritage sites um as we come out of covid19 um and i wonder how well we'll be able to kind of make that argument without reducing it to economic terms but being able to relate it to economic benefit i don't know if that's something that you're particularly thinking about now or that you've got experience managing I think that, um, yeah, I think it's always, always important that people understand um, the deeper um, outstanding universal value and the international significance and the possibilities for sharing and, 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 and all of those aspects. But sometimes when you work with um, heritage management, I think you have to be quite pragmatic. And I think it's always one of those um, balances, again, the dreadful balance word, but um, you do have to prove the economic case but the danger comes when that then strays into actually damage to the site or the significance of the site for people so it's a very fine line and it's almost a, a leadership um, uh, persuasion influencing and i think you have to give the right message to the right people to continue to achieve um the, the the protection and ongoing potential for a wide range of enjoyment and understanding so i i, I think you can't be if, if you're too purist in your argument for why you may find <laughs> that um you you lose i think you have to be clever to know what you need to achieve and and achieve that um that achieve that for for, for the world. Yeah. that's why the management plan with the vision and the aims is so important because as long as you know that you're sticking to those aims and visions you then have to find the way to get to where you are. I, I'm, I'm getting dangerously close to saying the ends justifies the means, but you, you, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think and I'm thinking back to when you're discussing the um, the fixed nature of the assessment of value and the kind of the naturally evolving and fluid nature of real life. You know, in existing time, things do change, even if the the value um, and and the kind of the description of what's valuable 
doesn't, but how you pragmatically pick a path through that and think, well, it is complex. You know, it just is. There's no, there's never going to be a black and white answer, and spending time looking for one is, is not going to be productive, really. I suppose it's a, a, a similar kind of stance. Yeah, no, I think you just have it. to. Um, you have to have people who are who are committed to protecting the. Um, legibility and I, I know it's, it's you, you will have people say well you know value is entirely created um, so that is problematic um, but you know um, at the same time if, if, if you use that argument you, you stray dangerously to the question of who is creating that value and who is manipulating the valuation of, of things so it does actually give us a nice firm stance to maintain the legibility of that but allow people to value it and interact with it in different ways that's how I see it personally yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a second question here from Summer Austin Bowden, apologies if I got that wrong, um, who's interested in whether there have been any instances of looting or destruction of the site since lockdown and just generally how is the site being secured in the absence of, of, of people? Um, that's interesting. I mean, we're, we're lucky enough because we're a rural site, you know, people are still moving around the site, not perhaps in the numbers they were previously, but, you know, the farmers are still farming um, and um, hopefully not plowing <laughs> some areas. But um, no, uh, seriously, the, there is, um, I think across um, the country, there has been an increase in heritage crime. Um, how that affects us in the site um, is... Um, maybe increased um uh, instances of of metal detecting we, we really really discourage metal detecting it's it's not allowed where, when there's an environmental stewardship in place but also you know it, it's very difficult because it would completely um ruin our understanding um of the site if we lose important evidence or it's shifted or moved so there's a little bit more um recognition of that um i think we we rarely set, suffer and we haven't done any major um, major destruction um, of of the monuments or, or sites, but th there is there is that issue which which does need to be watched carefully. And we have a um, you can report it to the police as a heritage crime, and it is taken fairly seriously. Yeah, and th they also do have um, people in place. I, I know um, for Stone Edge itself, there are security guards too. But across the wider landscape, um, yeah, it's a question of looking out and reporting. Thank you. I, I have, a, I guess, a final question, unless any sneak in under the wire. But um, you, you mentioned being part of the kind of UNESCO family. I just wondered how um, how that network of world heritage sites work together. Like, how how many of the things you described here are common across world heritage sites, and how many do you think are issues that Stonehenge encounters, um, perhaps to a greater degree than other places? Is it the do you find you have lots in common when you meet up? Or do you find yes. that actually there's I mean, lots of very local... It, it, it's actually concerns. fantastic. Um, world Heritage UK means that we can get together because it can be quite isolating in your own World Heritage site. And then you come together and you realise that everyone's facing similar types of challenges. I've also been lucky enough to go to um, some international conferences. And I went to one in Brazil when we had people from cultural landscapes. And um, whether it be the tequila fields in Mexico, the coffee landscapes of Colombia, um, the um, Duro wine regions of Portugal, um, that you, you find that there are um, very, very similar, similar uh, problems. The, the, the issue is it, it is quite hard to get involved on that more international level, but I think it's something we really need to strive for because there's a lot of learning and I learned huge amounts to bring back when I was in those places and we can do it virtually we we'll probably all have to do it virtually now but um it is it is a unesco site and it is absolutely important that we understand and share because that is the reason for the convention thank you very much well, i think that sounds like um, a fantastic place to wrap to wrap this up um what we'd normally do um is depart next door for wine and nibbles and if you happen to have a next door and some wine and nibbles then please feel free to go and do that but um in it, it's it's not really an exact replacement but we're going to leave the chat open um for 10 or 15 minutes just so that if people are keen to connect with other people in this chat or to kind of leave another question for us or to kind of just make any comments or observations um i'll i'll be around and um moderating that discussion for the next 10 minutes or so before we decamp though i'd just like to thank you once again very much sarah for a fascinating talk really really interesting um, it has been recorded so it will be on on the sites and on youtube 
Um, so if you want to go back and look at any of the slides, then um, I encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have a very good evening. Thank, Thank you. you.